After the hype of the new year, those of us running a small business need to keep things moving. Enter today's sponsor, Stamps.com, the online postage company dedicated to saving you time, money and stress. Stamps.com turbocharges your operational efficiency, giving you access to the USPS and UPS mailing services you need from wherever you do business, anytime, day or night. All you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything you need to get started. The Stamps.com app is like a portable post office in your pocket. Running low on shipping and mailing supplies? Easily order them through the supply store. Need a package pickup? Schedule one through the Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, Stamps seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Postage rates just increased again, but luckily, Stamps.com has the best discounts in the industry, with up to 89% off USPS and UPS. And what's more, they automatically tell you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. Keep your mailing and shipping moving at the speed of your business with Stamps. Sign up at stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Again, that's stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade, or click my link in the description. This is Abdul Shakur Azedi, a 35-year-old pizza shop worker, a resident of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and, for a time, the UK's most wanted man. January 31st, 2024. It was 7.25pm on Lesser Avenue, a leafy residential street just off Clapham Common, southwest London. Locals and passers-by could hear raised voices coming from inside a white Hyundai one parked just outside the Belvedere Hotel. Inside the vehicle was an unnamed 31-year-old woman, her two daughters, aged 8 and 3, and the woman's former boyfriend, Abdul Azedi. It's unclear how long the pair had been together, but they weren't married, and the children weren't Azedis, so it should have been a clean breakup. But Azedi had been left feeling bitter after the split. The unnamed woman had agreed to meet with him and talk things over that evening and Azedi had made the 280 mile journey from his home in Newcastle, apparently eager to discuss the situation face to face. But Azedi hadn't travelled all that way to have a rational conversation. He had come for revenge. And as the mother opened the door to leave the car, he lifted a bottle of liquid that he had brought with him, and hurled it into her face, splattering the woman's eldest daughter in the process. That bottle was filled with a corrosive alkaline. The woman and her eldest managed to escape the vehicle, clutching their faces and reaching out for one another. Azedi then reportedly took the youngest daughter out of the car, slammed her on the ground like a rag doll, and attempted to hit the mother with his vehicle. The mother's screams caught the attention of several residents who rushed over to help. One witness reported hearing her cry out, My eyes, my eyes, I can't see, where are my children? According to another witness, the woman's lips looked black, and her skin burned. With dozens of people now rushing over to help the mother and children, Azedi tried to flee the scene in his car, but instantly crashed into a stationary vehicle. Several brave locals tried to apprehend him, and many of them were injured in the process, but ultimately, Azedi was able to escape on foot. The woman and her children were rushed to a local NHS hospital. Thankfully, the three-year-old and eight-year-old weren't seriously hurt, but their mother was left in a critical condition. The attack left her blind in her right eye. She and her family are hopeful that her vision will eventually fully return in the other. Her friends have since described her as, quote, a devoted and loving mother. Her children are her life. She's generous to a fault and a wonderful cook and host. All she has ever wanted is a safe home for her and her beautiful, kind little girls. News of the incident sent shockwaves throughout the whole of the UK, with the general population chilled to the core that something so terrible had happened. There's something particularly stomach-churning about attacks designed to permanently disfigure, where the ultimate goal isn't to kill the victim's body, but their humanity, their identity, and their happiness. To not take their life, but to ruin it. To make them suffer. 
in a sense, it's even more vindictive than plain murder, and the fact that Azedi had made a five hour car journey to commit the act showed just how determined and demented he was. He could have stopped and reconsidered at any point during that trip, but he didn't. A nationwide manhunt was immediately launched, with the authorities releasing photos and information about Azedi to the public shortly after he went on the run, and offering a £20,000 reward for any information that led to his capture. An Afghan national, Azedi had made his way to the UK in 2016, where he was granted asylum. He found work at a pizza and kebab takeaway shop, where his co-workers described him as a bit too quiet, creepy, and always hiding in the back. In 2018, he was convicted of committing SA against one of his female friends in Newcastle. Despite this, he was given a suspended sentence and permitted to remain in the UK due to the tumultuous situation in his home country. Scotland Yard was now facing enormous pressure from an outraged public to find Azedi as soon as possible. With time being of the essence, and with no other immediate leads to work with, the police turned their attention to the most reliable witnesses of all the electronic eyes that line the big smoke's winding streets. London is famously one of the most surveilled cities in the world, easily the most surveilled outside of China, with an estimated 67 CCTV cameras for every 1,000 inhabitants. The average Londoner is caught on CCTV approximately 300 times per day. Though some people consider this a huge invasion of their privacy, others say that the cameras help create a greater sense of security and reduce crime. Still, whatever your position, they undoubtedly played a huge role in this case. Hundreds of hours of security footage were painstakingly scoured through, and officers were able to piece together Azedi's movements both before the incident took place and during his mysterious four hours thereafter. The day prior to the incident, Azedi was seen shopping in Newcastle. He then made his way to London by car, and was seen driving in Tooting at 6.30am on January 31st. There was another confirmed sighting of his vehicle in Croydon at 4.30pm, and again in Streatham at 7pm. The incident took place 25 minutes later. After fleeing the scene on foot, Azedi boarded the tube at Clapham South and used his bank card to travel to King's Cross Station. He was caught on CCTV buying a bottle of water at a Tesco Express at 8.42pm, where these clear shots highlighted just how badly Azedi had been injured during his attack. It appeared as if his right eye had been badly scalded by the alkali, making him all the more identifiable. However, at this point, the general public still weren't aware that he was a wanted man. He then boarded a train south to Victoria, and then another east to Tower Hill, before being caught on camera walking broadly westward. His last known sighting was on Vauxhall Bridge Road. For a time, that was the only information the public were given to ponder on. More than 500 people called in with tips, saying that they had seen Azedi in one part of the city or another. All of these tips were followed up on. None of them resulted in any new leads. For weeks, Azedi's whereabouts remained a mystery. Many people had their frustrations, questioning why the Met weren't able to find such an easily identifiable wanted man. Most suspected that he had somehow managed to escape the city without being detected, and was lying low somewhere with a trusted friend. He certainly wasn't walking the streets with a burned out eye. As the search continued, the authorities raided several properties in London and Newcastle, belonging to Azedi's connections, but these raids turned up no trace of him. As such, they decided to appeal to Azedi directly, broadcasting a simple warning. They could tell from the footage that he had sustained a terrible wound during his attack, and if he didn't turn himself over to receive medical treatment, he likely wouldn't survive. This appeal didn't result in Azedi's surrender. Was he still in hiding? Had he managed to escape the country? Well, the answer would eventually come to light. On February 9th, the authorities released new CCTV footage, along with a more plausible hypothesis about Azedi's whereabouts. Freshly discovered images showed the fugitive making his way along Chelsea Bridge at 11.19pm, walking with what investigators called a purposeful stride. He was then seen crossing the bridge before returning and looking over the edge at 11.27. From there, his digital footprint went dark. There were no further sightings of him on CCTV, and his bank accounts remained inactive. 
That meant he either escaped central London without being caught by any cameras, or, more likely, he had jumped into the Thames River at a particularly hazardous point. The Thames has long been considered a dangerous river to enter due to its strong tide, deep riverbed, freezing temperatures, and the sheer number of snags in its depths. Some people go in, and don't surface for years. Some are never found at all. There's a reason certain sections have historically morbid names, like Dead Man's Dock and Dead Man's Steps. On average, a body washes up somewhere along its 213 mile bank each week. Most don't make headlines. Indeed, as the RNLI searched the murky river for Rossetti, they found four bodies that were confirmed not to be him. Nameless does, yet to be linked to missing persons reports, if they ever were reported missing in the first place. Then, on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, a passing boat reported seeing an object in the water near Tower Pier, four miles from Rossetti's last known position. It appeared to be another body. Though initially unidentifiable due to bloating, the following day, it was confirmed to be him. Based on the distinctive clothing he was wearing at the time of the attack and property found on his body, we strongly believe we have recovered the body of a Zeddy, said Commander John Savile. We've been in contact with his family to pass on the news. An examination confirmed his COD was drowning. Though we'll never know what Azedi's actual plan was, he perhaps hadn't intended to end his own existence that day, and only did so after realising he'd probably never be able to escape with a bad facial burn and no vehicle. He likely spent his final four hours contemplating his situation before leaping into the river. For the victims of Azedi's heinous act, the scars, both physical and emotional, will serve as enduring reminders of that fateful day. At time of recording, a GoFundMe page has raised over £50,000 to help the mother and her daughters rebuild their lives. I've linked it in the description below. Born in 1976 in Puyallup, Washington, Joshua Powell had what can only be described as a deeply dysfunctional upbringing, mainly because his father, Stephen Powell, was a deeply dysfunctional man. From a young age, he had exposed Joshua and his siblings to adult material and allowed them to do whatever they pleased with very little discipline. During his teenage years, Joshua would make threats towards his mother while holding a butcher's blade, and on one occasion, deliberately killed his sister's gerbil right in front of her. His behaviour at home only became worse with age too, as he began developing and displaying ever more destructive and antisocial behavioural traits. However, while out in public, Josh had learned how to put on a mask of normalcy, ways to control his impulses and act civilised, ways to convince others he wasn't a sociopath. After graduating from high school, Josh relocated to Seattle and enrolled at the University of Washington. It was there that he met his first girlfriend, Catherine Everett. They entered into a brief relationship, and although he initially came across as a considerate and attentive partner, Josh's behaviour soon shifted. He became more controlling and began isolating Catherine from her loved ones. Feeling trapped and unsafe, Catherine planned a getaway to Utah and never returned, ending her relationship with Josh in November 2000. Shortly after their breakup, Josh would meet Susan Cox at a social gathering. Much like before, he presented himself as a kind, caring and well-adjusted young man, and Susan fell head over heels for him. After a whirlwind romance, the pair married in April 2001, less than half a year after they had first met. After graduating university, they relocated to South Hill and moved in with Josh's now single father, Stephen. I just had was probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. I just I hate to say it, I mean, of course, I haven't had that many experiences, but Susan has been feeling ill, she had a cold, and I offered to rub her 
feet to rub her toes to give her some stimulation. That went on. I probably rubbed her feet. Her toes are beautiful feet. She has such pretty feet. Of course, everything about her is pretty beautiful. And I know she felt it. I mean, I know she, and she couldn't have missed it. She's not naive either, I know, from what I've read in her journals. Um, I didn't want to push my luck. Josh was sitting across the room on the, on the chair, and he wasn't always watching, so I sort of took liberties as he didn't watch. And, um, and uh, I, uh, wow. Well, and I, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to remember everything I did. And I love that woman. She is so beautiful. I can't even get enough of her. Can't get enough of her looking at her. She's so, so pretty. While living with the couple in South Hill, Josh's father, Stephen, developed an intense infatuation with Susan, exhibiting obsessive behaviour such as reading her personal journal, spying on her in the bathroom using a small mirror, sharing love songs online under a pseudonym, and keeping a video diary detailing each encounter with his daughter-in-law. He even went so far as to stalk Susan and make voyeuristic recordings of her. Things escalated further when Stephen confessed his romantic feelings for Susan, telling her how much she meant to him right in front of her husband and his son, Josh. For his part, Josh didn't seem to mind that much. In fact, he responded with, well, you know, that's my dad. However, following an incident where Stephen attempted to kiss Susan, the newlyweds decided to move into their own apartment in West Valley City, Utah. Despite Josh becoming more possessive with Susan as he had with Charlotte, the couple welcomed their first son, Charles, into the world in 2005, followed by their second son, Brayden, in 2007. All the while, Stephen continued to make inappropriate advances towards Susan, keeping in regular contact with his son Josh and asking for updates about her. He even mailed a package to their home, one which contained photos of clothless men. While in West Valley City, Joshua's behaviour turned increasingly erratic and controlling, and Susan grew concerned for her safety. It didn't help that Josh was spending money at an alarming rate and racking up $200,000 worth of debt. In July 2008, she wrote a secret last will and testament, which she hid inside the house. I want it documented that there is extreme turmoil in our marriage. If I die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. On December 6, 2009, a neighbour of the Powell family visited Charles, Braden, and Susan while Josh was away at work. They left at approximately 5pm. Another neighbour observed Josh returning home and parking the family's Chrysler Town and Country minivan in the garage at about 8pm. At just before midnight, that same neighbour heard the minivan's alarm going off inside the garage. About two hours later, they heard a man and woman screaming loudly. The voices seemed to be coming from inside the Powell residence. The male voice was heard yelling, Get into the van, while the woman yelled back, No, you're going to hurt me if I do. From their window, the neighbour saw the Powell family's van leaving the home with four occupants, though they couldn't make out who exactly the figures were. When Josh and Susan didn't show up for work the next morning, and their sons weren't dropped off at daycare, Josh's mother reported them missing. Neither Josh nor Susan were reachable by phone, and fearing that they may have succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning, the authorities forcibly gained access to their home. They found no signs of a struggle or foul play inside the residence, but did discover Susan's purse, which contained her wallet and ID. They also found Susan's handwritten will, which detailed her fears about Josh. Disturbingly, they also found a wet patch on the couch in the living room, with two fans aimed at it. At 5pm that same day, Josh returned home alive and well with Charles and Braden. 
but Susan was nowhere to be seen. Detectives noticed that Josh's hands were dirty and covered in cuts. Josh claimed that he and the boys had left for an impromptu camping trip along the Pony Express Trail just after midnight, and Susan had stayed at home in bed. Her whereabouts were as much a mystery to him as they were to everyone else. As soon as I heard that he was back and Susan wasn't with them, I instantly said to myself, What has he done? said Susan's friend, Kersey Hellowell. Susan would have never allowed him to take the boys out to the desert in the winter. And in the middle of the night? Never. The investigators also found Josh's story less than compelling and asked him to come in for questioning. When asked why he hadn't attended work or notified his boss about his absence on December 7th, Josh simply claimed that he got the days mixed up and thought that it was Sunday instead of Monday. An easy mistake. Regarding his unanswered phone, he blamed a low battery and not having a charger with him. After searching the family minivan though, the police found a shovel, tarps, blankets, a gas container, and a generator. They also discovered Susan's cell phone in the van. The SIM card had been removed. During their investigation into Susan's disappearance, several concerning pieces of information came to light. For example, Josh had taken out a $1.5 million life insurance policy on Susan just a few months before she vanished. He'd also transferred $12,000 from Susan's bank account to his personal account days after she disappeared. Further evidence showed Josh making trips to the desert on the night of December 6th and the morning of December 7th. Curiously, Josh had mentioned to several co-workers about how you could hide a body in an abandoned mineshaft in the desert. In cases where a person suddenly disappears, their spouse is typically considered the first person of interest, but Josh's actions and answers led investigators to instantly hone in on him as the prime suspect. The police interviewed Josh and Susan's eldest son, Charlie, who confirmed that the family had gone on a camping trip that night. However, contrary to his father's account, Charlie mentioned that Susan had gone with them that night and hadn't come back. Several weeks after Susan's disappearance, a teacher reported that Charlie had mentioned his mother was deceased. Additionally, Susan's parents, Chuck and Jody Cox, asserted that several months after their daughter's disappearance, Braden drew a picture of a van with three individuals inside, stating, Mummy was in the trunk. During a search of the Powell home on December 9th, investigators discovered traces of Susan's blood on the floor as well as another sample, which was attributed to an unknown male, one whose DNA wasn't on the national database. And yet, despite all of this evidence against Josh, he was never charged in connection with his wife's disappearance. The investigation continued for several years, during which time Josh and most of his family maintained that Susan had run off with another man. He never participated in any search efforts for his wife. Due to financial issues, Josh moved back in with his family, taking his sons Charlie and Braden with him. He was later deemed unfit to take care of them, but was granted supervised visitation several times a week. On February 5th, 2012, social worker Elizabeth Hall dialed 911 after escorting Charlie, now seven, and Braden, five, to a supervised visit at Josh's residence in South Hill. Hall, who was responsible for overseeing the visit, said that Josh seized his sons and prevented her from entering the premises. But while she waited outside for officers to arrive at the scene, the house suddenly and unexpectedly exploded. Investigators later found the remains of Josh, Charlie and Braden inside the ruins. Josh had murdered his two sons with a hatchet before sending out farewell emails to his friends and family. He then intentionally set the house ablaze with two cans of gasoline ending his own existence in the process. Josh had designated his brother Michael as the primary beneficiary of his life insurance policy, though Michael himself would go on to end his own existence in 2013, leaping from a rooftop in Minneapolis. It's believed that Michael knew where Susan's remains were buried, and that he may have been complicit in her slaying. It's believed that Josh told his father, Stephen, about Susan's final resting place too. Stephen had been jailed for seven years in 2012 on voyeurism and CP charges. He had been taking secret videos of women and youngsters while out in public. During his incarceration, 
he invoked his Fifth Amendment right whenever he was questioned about Susan. He passed from natural causes in 2018, taking whatever secrets he may have held with him to the grave. As of today, Susan's whereabouts remains unknown. Offshore oil rigs, notorious for being among the most dangerous of work environments, where heavy machinery, hazardous substances, and unpredictable weather surround you at all times, where death is never more than a simple mistake away, and it doesn't even have to be your mistake. One of offshore drilling's most catastrophic events occurred on July 6th, 1988. Piper Alpha was an oil production platform operated by Occidental Petroleum. It primarily extracted oil and gas from the Piper oil field, which was one of the largest in the North Sea at the time, located approximately 120 miles northeast of Aberdeen, Scotland. The platform itself consisted of several modules, including the drilling area located in Module A, and on the opposite side of the rig, the living quarters and the control room in Module D. 226 workers were manning the rig that fateful day, working hard to extract their daily quota of 125,000 barrels of oil and maintain their status as the world's single largest oil producer. They'd usually aim for 360,000 barrels, but the rig was in the middle of a major revamp at the time, and so production was slowed. Several senior personnel members had questioned whether it was safe to continue oil production while the upgrade was taking place, but Occidental were adamant that enough safety measures had been put in place and that operation should continue. That morning, a routine maintenance procedure on one of the platform's condensate pumps was taking place in Module C, during which time Pump A was shut down and the vital safety valve covering it removed. A temporary flat metal disc cover, or blank flange, was used to seal the valve while maintenance took place. The flange was hand tightened only, and since work couldn't be completed by 6pm, it was to be left in place overnight. Due to an administrative error, that information failed to make its way to any of the night shift workers. That same day, at 9.45pm, Pump B stopped and couldn't be restarted. Unaware that the safety valve had been removed, the operators were under the impression that it was safe to restart Pump A and keep production moving. At just after 10pm, gas was reintroduced into Pump A. The temporary flange couldn't withstand the pressure. A high-pitched, high-pressure gas leak rang out through the pump room, and several alarms immediately began to sound. But before anyone could act, the gas ignited, causing a massive explosion on the platform and launching a blue fireball into the sky. The walls and doors of the rig were only fire-resistant, not explosion-proof, and the force of the blast ruptured nearby pipelines and oil storage tanks, instantly killing dozens of crewmen and leading to further fires and explosions. Control room operator Jeff Bollens, who had survived the initial blast, managed to activate the emergency stop button on Piper Alpha, which closed the isolation valves and stopped all oil and gas production, buying his fellow workers some time. Most of the workforce were relaxing in Module D when the first boom rang out and were knocked from their bunks by the shockwave. The emergency alarm had been destroyed in Module C, and they were unaware of just how quickly the fires were spreading. The water system designed to put out such blazes also failed to activate, and before long, the heat struck them. The fires were raging at a white-hot 1000 degrees centigrade, and many squeezed tomato juice onto their faces to relieve the burning sensation. Mayday calls were placed, but since the control room had now gone up in flames, no orders were being given or received, and each individual trapped survivor was faced with a hellish choice. Whether to follow protocol, stay on the platform, and wait to be evacuated, or to escape the wreck by jumping into the freezing North Sea. They'd all been told time and time again to never leap from the platform during a fire, because if impacting the water didn't kill you, then hypothermia would. Their odds of survival were apparently far greater if they fought that instinct and sat tight for rescue crafts to arrive. As such, 87 men opted to stay in the fireproofed accommodation block, located in Module D. The rest abandoned their training and abandoned the rig. Due to how quickly the flames and black smoke were spreading though, there were few safe points that they could escape from. Some ran blindly through the thick, black smoke, 
and by sheer luck found a safe opening. Some managed to climb down via ropes. Five workers, including a new father, Mark Reed, were able to fight their way to the scorched teledeck and leapt 175 feet into the water below. Others weren't so lucky. They choked on fumes or hit the water too hard and lost consciousness. Those still inside the accommodation block sat in pitch blackness and held out hope for rescue. Throughout this, two other oil rigs in the area, Tartan and Claymore, continued to feed gas and oil to Piper Alpha for hours, helping to fuel the inferno. And that's despite the fact that their operators could see flames on the horizon. Since it could take days to restart a rig after shutting it down, and since none of the workers wanted to lose their jobs, they opted to continue operating as normal. They only stopped when one operator ignored commands from a superior and shut down the gas lines. The remote location of Piper Alpha and the severity of the fires presented significant challenges for rescue efforts. Helicopters and nearby vessels attempted to save survivors, but the intense heat and smoke made it difficult to approach the platform. Ships mounted with high-pressure water cannons weren't able to spray the flames at full strength since the force of the water was powerful enough to kill any survivors trapped on board. At approximately 11.45pm, Piper Alpha started to crumble. One of the cranes plummeted, followed by the drilling derrick, and eventually the accommodation block slipped into the North Sea, taking with it the 87 crew members sheltered inside. By 12.45am on July 7th, almost all of Piper Alpha had collapsed. Module A was all that remained standing. The fire continued to blaze for more than three weeks. In late 1988, a dive team salvaged the accommodation block from the sea floor. These images show the block being lifted from the water. Inside it were the bodies of the 87 men who had followed Occidental's protocol. Out of the 226 workers on board at the time of the incident, only 61 survived, fewer than a third. Two rescue personnel also lost their lives attempting to save trap workers. Many of the fatalities were due to the initial explosion. Several had succumbed to the flames. Others perished from exposure or drowning in the cold water, though the majority were suffocated by smoke and toxic fumes. Thirty bodies were never recovered. Occidental paid out 100 million US dollars to families of the deceased, but escaped any kind of criminal or civil sanction. They received 1.4 billion dollars in insurance claims. The incident resulted in new safety measures being introduced to protect offshore workers. If you enjoyed the video and you'd like to see more, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future uploads. Before we end, a huge thank you to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Modest Bulbasaur, Alana Pons, Asia Mina, Azrael Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Sai Wazau, Farewell Tattoos Jack Zephel, Gina Valera, Hamish, Ian Billock, Kevin Villa, Monica Mendoza, Peter Olgerach, Smiling Jack, TNS Mum, Hamish K, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allon, Nefes1988, and Lydia Cumo. Thank you all so much for your continued support.